Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. My wife, Jean, lived with Progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join our webcast, so let's give them just another few seconds, and then we'll get started. Thank you to all of you who are joining us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the very topics that impact people affected by MS every single day. So as I chat with our expert today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. If you're like me, you're probably more than happy to close out 2020. While the year presented us with new challenges and forced us to connect with each other in different ways, it was also a year of meaningful accomplishments that were focused on improving the quality of life for people affected by MS. Today, we're highlighting newly approved disease-modifying therapies, new exercise recommendations, strategies to navigate telemedicine, and advances in what we know about women's reproductive health and MS. We're talking with Dr. Barbara Geyser, a neurologist from the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Geyser is an internationally recognized clinician and award-winning educator who has specialized in the care of people with multiple sclerosis since 1982. Dr. Geyser's approach to the diagnosis and management of MS combines state-of-the-art diagnostics and personalized medication plans for each patient with an emphasis on integrating lifestyle and wellness strategies into the patient's neurologic treatment plan. Dr. Geyser volunteers extensively for the National MS Society, and she was elected to the Volunteer Hall of Fame in 2018. Dr. Geyser is a former chair of the Society's Clinical Fellowship Committee and the past co-chair of the Healthcare Provider Council. She currently serves on the Wellness Research Working Group Welcome, Dr. Geyser, and thank you for being with us today. Good morning, John. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for asking me to participate in this week's webinar. You know, over the course of the past year, we've seen several new disease-modifying therapies receive FDA approval and come to market. And as we get into talking about some of these new disease-modifying therapies, I'd just like to remind our viewers that establishing and following a treatment plan with your healthcare provider is the best strategy for managing your MS. Now, to get us started, Dr. Geyser, can you give us an overview of what's actually happening? What's going on in the central nervous system when someone has MS? So, as I'm sure most of our listeners know, MS is a disease where the central nervous system is under attack by the immune system. Normally, our immune system protects us against outside uh, infections and other things that they perceive as foreign. In MS, the immune system goes rogue. The immune system has gotten the wrong message, and it thinks that part of the central nervous system is a foreign entity. Normally, immune cells do not gain access, for the most part, into the central nervous system, but in MS, Parts of the immune system become turned on, they gain the ability to get into the central nervous system, and they launch an attack against the nerves. And what we can see in the um, picture here is uh, normally we have layers of insulating material on nerves. The insulation is called myelin, and it's just like insulation on an electrical cable. It helps the nerve conduct electrical and chemical impulses uh, efficiently and uh, swiftly. 
And when the immune attack happens, the myelin is damaged. And so it's like having a frayed wire. The electrical impulses cannot be appropriately conducted. Um, in more uh, long-standing damage, the actual nerve wire itself, the axon is damaged as well. When you have failure of electrical and chemical transmission, that's what leads to symptoms and dysfunction. And so um, all of our DMTs, our disease-modifying therapies, are drugs that interfere with the immune system's ability to get into the central nervous system and attack the nerves. Well, let's look at the disease-modifying therapies that were introduced over the past year. What can you tell us about key symptoms? So we have three new drugs that were introduced in 2020, and I'll just make a short comment that these are what doctors sometimes call me too drugs, meaning they're not drugs that have an entirely new or different mechanism of action from our approved therapies, but they're slightly different forms of some drugs with, with uh, established mechanisms of actions. So uh, Kisimta, which is the brand name for a monoclonal antibody called Ofatumumab, is very similar in mechanism of action to a drug called Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab. And both Kisimta and Ocrevus work uh, by targeting certain white blood cells called B cells. These B cells help to turn on other cells, which are responsible for a lot of the damage. And B cells also have other mechanisms as well. So Kisimta's mechanism of action is very similar to Ocrevus. The um, big difference is that Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab, is administered by an intravenous twice a year, and Kisimta is administered by the patient themselves as a very small under-the-skin injection once a month. And what types of MS is Kisimta approved to treat? So Kisimta has FDA indication for what are called relapsing forms of MS. This includes relapsing remitting MS, what we call clinically isolated syndrome, which is an initial attack of MS, and what is termed active secondary progressive MS. These are people that have secondary progressive disease, but they may have superimposed relapses or they have inflammation on their MRIs. So, uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please go ahead. Um, Kisimta in the pivotal clinical trials, Kisimta was tested against uh, another uh, MS drug, and it had a statistically significant effect in reducing relapses and uh, nerve damage on MRI. So its mechanism of action is very similar to ocrelizumab, but it's administered differently. Another DMT that received approval in 2020 was Zaposia. So what is Zaposia, and, and how does it work? So Zaposia is the brand name for a drug called Ozanamod. Uh, it's an oral drug, and it's in the same class of agents as two older oral agents, Gelenia or Fingolimod, and Mazent or Siponimod. And uh, these drugs uh, are called S1P uh, receptor uh, drugs, and they have a very interesting mechanism of action. We had said that the problem in MS is that white blood cells become sort of attack white blood cells and they get into the central nervous system from the blood. Well, these types of drugs, um, Zaposia and Mazent and Gelenia, work by sequestering white blood cells in the lymph nodes. If they can't get into the blood, they can't get into the brain. Um, there are different um, receptors, different parts of cells that these drugs to attach to. And one of the big differences between Zaposia and, say, the older drug, uh, Gelenia, is that the Zaposia is a little bit more selective. One of the main possible side effects with Gelenia is that it can slow the heart rate. Zaposia has less, uh, much less affinity for the receptors that are on the heart muscle cells, so that's not as much of a problem with Zaposia. And, and finally, what can you tell us about Baffertam? Baffertam uh, belongs to the same class of drugs as two other oral agents, uh, which people may know uh, by uh, the name Tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate, and a, a, another version uh, of it, uh, uh, this that was also introduced called Vumerity. They're all very similar. These drugs have multiple mechanisms of actions, uh, as opposed to our other two drugs that we were just talking about, which are a little bit more specific. 
but um, the, uh, the uh, fumarates, as we'll call them, have a number of different ways in which they interfere with the immune system's ability to attack the nerves. They're thought to decrease inflammatory proteins. They're thought to um, activate uh, antioxidant pathways. They have a number of different effects. Um, the uh, generic name for Tecfidera is dimethylfumarate, and the body converts it to monomethylfumarate. Bafiertam is the brand name for monomethylfumarate. It's already in the active form, so the body has one uh, less um, metabolic pass to go through. And uh, Bafiertam is said to have a little better side effect profile than Tecfidera. What types of MS is uh, Bafiertam approved to treat, and how well does it work? Um, again, similarly to uh, Tecfidera, uh, Bafiertam is approved for relapsing remitting MS, uh, active secondary progressive MS, and clinically isolated syndrome. Uh, Bafiertam has not been studied certainly head-to-head -head with Tecfidera, but because it is the active form, it is thought to have very comparable safety and efficacy profile. You know, with these latest options available, I think we're up to somewhere around 20 approved disease modifying therapies for MS. How does someone decide which treatment is best for them? That's a great question, John. And you're right, there are about 20 uh, FDA approved DMTs and there are even a couple of drugs that we use off label. Uh, and there is not a one size fits all. There isn't one best drug. And this is a very individualized decision that people have to make with their health care provider. Some of the things that um, the healthcare provider and the patient may want to take into account is how active the person's disease is, what their lifestyle is, um, perhaps how they've reacted to other drugs. Um, there are actually two trials that are uh, currently going on right now, which are testing whether it's better to uh, assign people to very high efficacy drugs as soon as they're diagnosed or to perhaps pick um, a, a different uh, class of efficacy drugs and escalate if needed. And I think this is a very important question and we should have results from these trials in a couple of years and, and that will help direct us. In the meantime, uh, this is a very nuanced decision that uh, has to be worked out between the patient and the healthcare provider. Well, thank you, Dr. Geiser. But before we continue our discussion, I wanna welcome those of you who have continued to join us on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Please let us know what's on your mind. Post your comments and questions on Facebook and YouTube or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. Our Ask an MS Expert live event takes place at this same time every Friday. So please help us make sure that everyone knows about it by sharing news about the webcast with your family, your friends, and your social media. Let's change gears for a moment and talk about something that's proven to be quite effective in managing MS, and that's exercise. Now you were part of a team of experts who worked with the National MS Society and published new exercise recommendations for people living with MS just earlier this year. Can you share those recommendations with us? I'm very excited to talk about this. And um, one of the reasons is, as you mentioned, I've, I've been working with people with MS for a pretty long time. And when I first entered the field, most people with MS were told not to exercise and not to be active. And uh, I, I sometimes tell my patients, if you could have picked the one single worst thing we could have told folks back then, that probably would have been it. So the past several decades, we've certainly become enlightened and we've gotten a lot of um, information about the benefits of exercise. This was a task force that was convened by the National MS Society and included neurologists and nurses and physical therapists and exercise physiologists and scientists. So it was a very, very broad task force. And uh, what we did is we looked at uh, all the literature that we could find, published studies of randomized uh, and uh, other trials of exercise in different populations of people with MS. And so we did it across the entire spectrum of people with MS, people with little or no physical disability, all the way to people who were uh, very markedly affected physically by MS. And our conclusions were that everybody with MS can and should exercise. And so we have recommendations across the MS spectrum. 
basically, uh, you can break this down into kind of four different categories or four different exercise modalities. There's certainly aerobic exercise, which, you know, things that gets your heart rate going or, you know, maybe makes you break a sweat. There's resistance exercise, which improves strength. There's stretching and flexibility exercises, which would include stretching or yoga. And then finally, there's what we call neuromotor exercises, which are things which incorporate physical and um, cognitive um, uh, modalities. And one very good example of this would be dancing or Tai Chi. And the recommendations are ideally for people to try to incorporate all four of these modalities as much as possible. And the, the simple number to remember is 150 minutes a week of exercise and or physical activity. Physical activity is basically anything that gets you moving. So housekeeping is physical activity, walking the dog, playing ball with your kids, dancing, anything that gets you moving is physical activity. For people that are not ambulatory, propelling a wheelchair is certainly physical activity. So the trick is just to move it and, again, ideally to combine as many of these different modalities as possible. I think it's, it's worth circling back to this, but uh, in terms of how your task force actually arrived at these recommendations, these are evidence-based? Are they expert opinion? Is it a combination of both? Yes, it's a combination of both. Where we could find uh, studies in the literature that were evidence-based, we were able to come up with evidence-based recommendations. Um, for people at the more disabled end of the spectrum, people that are not ambulatory, people uh, that are in wheelchairs, there's less uh, uh, evidence-based. And so because we had our panel of experts, we used uh, expert recommendation and clinical experience. And once again, when you say exercise is recommended for all people with MS and you're including people with a higher level of disability, they should be doing some sort of physical activity as well, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, certainly for people that are uh, non-ambulatory but perhaps have good upper body strength, there's certainly arm cycling things, there are chair exercises. People that um, cannot manage those, certainly they can do stretching, either passive stretching or active stretching with another individual. They can certainly do breathing exercises. Um, positioning is important. So um, really people at all levels uh, can and should benefit from movement and stretching and breathing and physical activity. And should they be reviewing their plan or developing their plan for physical activity or exercise with a healthcare professional? Of course, and thank you for bringing that up. So depending on the level of activity or exercise that someone wants to undertake and depending what their resources are, uh, absolutely uh, discuss this uh, certainly with your neurologist or primary health care provider. If it's feasible to have consultation with a physical therapist or a fitness or exercise specialist, that um, is also uh, optimal as well. You know, we, there's so much to talk about in terms of things that have changed in 2020. The use of telemedicine changed significantly in 2020. I mean, during the pandemic, access to telemedicine has really provided a way for people living with MS to safely keep their medical appointments and take advantage of those opportunities to discuss specific medical concerns, develop treatment plans, and continue their MS care. Now, telemedicine isn't new, but its widespread use certainly is. I'm wondering whether you've seen any changes in telemedicine. So uh, I actually uh, have been doing telemedicine for a couple of decades. You're very correct. Telemedicine itself is not new. What's new is our more widespread use of it. And also some regulations have been relaxed to enable uh, providers to be able to conduct uh, visits over telemedicine. Uh, I think maybe it's a, a tiny little bit of a silver lining of this horrible pandemic is that some patients who may not have been able to come uh, in person uh, for a visit now can access telemedicine to get care from their providers. I'm thinking that even people in more rural areas who um, may not have an MS specialist within a reasonable distance all of a sudden can access that kind of specialty care 
through telemedicine. That's that's exactly right. Um, I once had the opportunity to do a telemedicine visit uh, with a, a patient who was in a very, very remote area. She's actually up near a mountain. And she said that she'd not been able to see a provider for many years. And now the telemedicine had afforded her that opportunity. And your point about uh, MS expertise is an excellent one. There may be areas where there isn't a local MS expert. So we're happy to be able to provide that uh, over the camera. So how can someone best prepare for a virtual medical appointment? Well, in, in many respects, preparing for a virtual appointment is very similar to preparing for an in-person appointment. You certainly, uh, it helps to have a list of questions or a list of issues that are the most important to you that you want to discuss with your healthcare provider. It's uh, very useful to have a list of up-to-date medications. Certainly if you've had uh, since your last visit any um, exacerbations or untold side effects to medications, uh, you want to bring that to your healthcare provider's attention as well. In terms of the telemedicine, uh, you certainly want to make sure that your uh, computer equipment or whatever platform you're going to use is working. Uh, ideally, you want to have it in a quiet environment so that you're not uh, distracted. Um, although I've seen people's pets come in, that's kind of fun. And you want to make sure that the lighting is good so that your healthcare provider uh, can see you. Uh, and people that are ambulatory, uh, it's helpful for us as healthcare providers if there's a bit of distance where we may ask you to walk. I'm wondering, does someone with MS still need in-person care then? So telemedicine can do a lot of things, and we certainly can talk to people, we can get a history, we can see how they're talking and moving, but it's hard to do certain aspects of the neurologic exam. So certainly my personal preference is, if at all feasible, um, I would like to see somebody for an in-person visit um, if I've not seen them in a year or so. Now, obviously, we have to respect conditions of the pandemic, and I would never compromise anybody's safety for an in-person visit. But uh, at the end of the day, we can do a lot with telemedicine, but it does not completely replace an in-person neurologic exam. You know, the MS Society convened a telemedicine working group with input from neurologists, mental health specialists, and rehabilitation experts to establish guidance for people living with MS to help navigate their telehealth visits. I want our viewers to know that they can access these tips for successful telemedicine appointments by visiting the nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19. And you'll get a great set of tips that'll help make those appointments better for you, more meaningful to you, and ultimately better outcomes. We also learned a lot this year from research in the area of women's reproductive health. And this is especially important because MS is three times more common in women than men, and it's more prevalent in women of childbearing age than any other age group. Dr. Geyser, many women want to know what happens to their MS if they decide to get pregnant, especially in the postpartum period. So what do recent studies tell us about the impact of pregnancy on MS? Well, we've had some very encouraging news uh, from some uh, publications that came out uh, last year in 2020, and you're very correct. Most people who uh, have MS are young women in their uh, reproductive years. And again, in the bad old days, which unfortunately I'm old enough to remember, uh, women with MS were very often told not to get pregnant because it was thought that pregnancy was deleterious to them. We now know that just the opposite is true, that uh, during pregnancy, the MS is quieted down. The pregnancy itself has a disease-modifying effect, if you will, and the exacerbation rate goes way down for uh, almost every woman who is pregnant. Based on some older literature, there had been a paper published uh, in the late 1990s, which has looked at a large number of pregnancies and indicated that there seemed to be a little bit of a rebound phenomenon, if you will, that the pregnancy rate spiked up uh, in the first several months postpartum. Our new publication, which was done by Dr. Annette Langer-Gould, who is an expert in this area, she's here in Los Angeles, and she looked at almost 500 pregnancies. And uh, in those women, um, the uh, 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 relapse rate went down during the pregnancy 
um, stayed down. And then after uh, the uh, postpartum period and the postpartum period, it went back up to the pre-pregnancy rate, but it did not go higher. There did not seem to be this rebound effect that had previously been noticed. The other very interesting thing about this study was that um, they looked at the breastfeeding practices of the women in this study. And in women who exclusively breastfed, meaning that the baby got nothing but the mother's breast milk for at least two months, the uh, relapse rate in the first six months postpartum was lower than the women who did not exclusively breastfeed or did not uh, breastfeed at all. This was only for the first six months. And overall, in the first post-pregnancy year, in the first 12 months postpartum, only about a quarter of the women had relapses at all. So um, again, we've known for a while that pregnancy itself uh, has a beneficial effect on uh, MS in terms of dropping the relapse rate during pregnancy. This one study uh, seems to indicate that we don't have to worry so much about a rebound effect postpartum for the majority of women with MS. The uh, predictors of having a postpartum relapse, however, were women who uh, had more disability uh, before they became pregnant, women who had had more relapses before they became pregnant. Um, and so these women still might be at higher risk for relapse uh, than uh, some other women. You know, we've traditionally heard that it's not safe to be on any disease modifying therapy when you're planning a pregnancy. What did we learn this year about the safety of DMTs in pregnancy? So uh, this builds on some uh, work that's been around for a while. And um, there were some studies that looked at exposure to two of our older DMTs, our, our first DMTs, uh, beta interferon. These would include Rebit, beta seron, Avonix, Extavia and um, glutiramir acetate, this would be copaxone, uh, glutopa. And um, it's thought that uh, for uh, most people uh, think that it's safe for women to be on these drugs up until conception and then discontinued uh, as soon as the woman becomes pregnant. There's also some data that suggests that it may be safe to breastfeed while on these drugs. Um, I think this is uh, sort of up to the woman and her neurologist, but we have data that um, there's no known fetal harm from exposure uh, to, uh, to these drugs uh, up until conception. Well, we've covered a lot of information on a wide range of topics, ranging from disease-modifying therapies to exercise to telemedicine to women's reproductive health. I'll, I'll ask you a tough question now from all of that, Dr. Geiser. What are the top three takeaways that you'd like our audience to keep in mind? Well, in terms of disease modifying therapies, um, even though, as I say, these drugs are not uh, entirely new drugs from mechanisms of actions, um, it shows that uh, we are continuing to develop a more effective, uh, safer, and, and um, uh, more uh, uh, perhaps widely available uh, drugs to fight uh, different forms of multiple sclerosis, and we're making some inroads on progressive disease as well. Uh, in terms of reproductive health, um, again, given that, as we say, uh, most of the uh, MS population uh, are young women, I think that this is another indication that MS should not interfere with your life plans. Um, and that uh, family planning can proceed. And finally, um, because this is something I'm, I was personally involved in, um, exercise, exercise, exercise. It's good for everybody, and it's especially good for people with multiple sclerosis. Well, thank you for sharing those three takeaways, as well as all of your expertise with us today. Now I'd like to continue taking more of the questions that our audience has for you. Uh, Paul is currently on a disease-modifying therapy, but he experiences bad side effects and he's considering switching to one of the new therapies. What should people consider before switching the, their medication? Well, as I think we've commented previously, choosing a disease-modifying therapy is a, a uh, somewhat complicated process. Switching is uh, also a little complicated. 
if Paul's having side effects, um, but uh, otherwise the therapy seems to be working, depending on what the side effect is, there may be some strategies to help ameliorate the side effects. If, however, the side effects are not amenable to treatment or they're intolerable, or perhaps there's a side effect that may be potentially harmful, uh, such as uh, interference with uh, blood tests, which look at uh, blood and liver function, then Paul and his health care provider will have to have some discussion um, about switching an agent. It might be to another agent in the same class, or it might be to an agent with a different class and different mechanism of action. Janet wrote in to saying she's really happy to hear about three new DMTs for relapsing MS but she wants to know whether there are any treatments on the horizon for primary progressive MS. And I'll go ahead and ask a follow-up on her behalf. Why does it seem to be so challenging to develop therapies for progressive MS? So uh, maybe I can start with the second question first. So um, um, it's thought that the mechanism of nerve damage in progressive forms of disease is a little bit different than what happens in relapsing remitting disease. And so um, almost all of our current DMTs work uh, are more effective against relapsing forms. We haven't quite figured out all of the mechanisms of uh, progressive disease nerve damage, so that's why it's a little bit harder to design therapies for them. Having said that, ocrelizumab, ocrevus, is right now the only uh, disease-modifying therapy that has an FDA indication for primary progressive disease. It was tested in that population. There was a very exciting report about a compound called mastinib, um, which was published uh, in 2020. And mastinib was tested in people with both primary and secondary uh, progressive MS but not the relapsing forms. So these were people who didn't have that relapsing um, disease mechanism. And the mastinib uh, showed about a 37% decrease in slowing progression. Mastinib works on different parts of the immune system than some of our, our current agents. And so I think this is potentially a very exciting development. Uh, there's going to be some more trials but this may indicate that drugs with this type of mechanism of action may be useful uh, against progressive disease. And um, people want to look this up. The Mastinib is on the MS Society website. That's, uh, that's really encouraging news. Uh, Brianna is trying to start a family and she was just diagnosed with MS. So unlike people who may already be on a DMT and are thinking about whether they need to stop in order to become pregnant, She's not on a disease-modifying therapy yet, and she's wondering if she should continue trying to get pregnant, or does she take a break and start with a DMT? What advice do you have for newly diagnosed women who want to start families? Um, as, as we've previously discussed, this is a little bit of a complicated complication that Brianna should have with her healthcare provider. If Brianna has been having very active disease, if she's had a lot of relapses, if she has a lot of inflammation on her MRI, her health care provider may suggest that she start a treatment with a, a high efficacy DMT to kind of quiet the disease down and then attempt to get pregnant after her disease is quiet. If, on the other hand, um, Brianna has not had a lot of attacks, does not have a lot of disability, has a pretty quiet MRI, she and her healthcare provider may decide that um, it's appropriate for her to start trying to conceive. Also, as we discussed, um, we have data that suggests that she could start therapy with uh, glutyrimer acetate or beta interferon and stay on that until she becomes pregnant. So again, this is not a one size fits all. Joan is wondering if there are any exercise guidelines that help MS patients resist cognitive decline. So this is one of the more uh, exciting uh, areas, I think, of uh, uh, research, uh, uh, exercise research in people with multiple sclerosis. The literature is a little bit mixed on this, but there are studies uh, in small numbers of patients that have suggested that um, uh, exercise regimens may in fact improve cognitive function in people with MS. And this is really, really exciting because cognitive dysfunction can occur in at least 50% 
of people with MS. And right now, uh, we don't really have a lot of well-defined or very effective drug treatments. So again, the studies of exercise improving cognition in people with MS are small. Most of them have uh, involved aerobic modalities. So the short answer to Joan's question is there isn't a set regimen, but this is certainly something she could discuss with her healthcare provider. And as we previously pointed out, um, aerobic uh, and other forms of exercise uh, can benefit just about anybody with MS. Deborah uses a walker. And she's looking for exercises that will help mobility and balance. She wants to know if there are specific recommendations to help people with mobility and balance. And she's also uh, wondering about whether uh, seated exercise could be useful for her. So mobility and, and balance, uh, uh, problems with mobility and balance can certainly come from a number of different impairments. Um, Deborah may be having problems because her legs are weak or because her legs are very tight or spastic. She may be having problems because she doesn't have good feeling in her feet. And so as I sometimes say to my patients, her brain doesn't know where her legs are. She may have problems with the balance centers in the brain as well. So there are a number of different impairments that could affect mobility and balance. The best way to address these is to have a consultation with a physical therapist. Physical therapist can assess Deborah's gait, see what her specific problems are, and then develop a series of exercises to specifically overcome the uh, mobility and balance challenges. There certainly are chair exercises that people can do. There are chair exercises that can improve core. There are chair exercises for upper body strength. And again, this is best developed in consultation with a physical therapist. Richard is 72 years old. He was diagnosed with MS 27 years ago. And he's wondering if he needs to continue with the disease modifying therapy. So what can you tell us about stopping treatment in your senior years? So this is a very interesting area, and this is a, an area of research that is, is just starting to be explored. There are a few studies that are published on this, and there is currently a randomized controlled trial uh, of stopping, uh, randomizing people to starting or stopping or continuing their DMT. There uh, is a little bit of data that suggests that in people who are older, say older than 50, who have not had relapses in several years, who have not had evidence of new or inflammatory activity on their MRIs, that it may be appropriate to consider uh, a trial of stopping disease-modifying therapy. Um, but again, this is uh, obviously up uh, to the person and their healthcare provider, uh, and uh, a trial of stopping could be undertaken with the knowledge, of course, that the patient may uh, incur disability if they stop medication. Um, I sometimes tell my patients uh, if they've been doing well and they ask me should they stop their medication, that I can't tell if they're doing well because of their medication or in spite of it. But we have a little bit of, of data that older patients uh, with very stable disease may be able to discontinue medication. I think this is an area where we're going to see more research and more data to help guide us. When he's considering telemedicine, Gerald wants to know how his privacy is protected during virtual visits. Now, is it possible someone could hear the conversation between you and a patient? Um, I'm, I'm not an IT person, so I have to, to caveat my answer. But my understanding is that the, the platforms that are generally approved, uh, things like Zoom, uh, have to be what we call HIPAA compliant, meaning they have to be uh, able to safeguard people's privacy. I suggest if Gerald has a concern, he can certainly ask his healthcare provider about their IT platform. Makes sense. Well, I want to thank everyone who submitted your questions today, and thank you, Dr. Geiser, for being with us today. It's been my pleasure, and I hope this has been useful for our listeners. I'm sure that it has. You know, I think one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you, and these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. I want to remind you that if we were unable to get to your question today, the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner 
in answering your questions and connecting you to the very best information and resources. Telemedicine has become more important and more accessible during the pandemic, and it's likely going to stay with us. I want to remind you again that you can access tips for a successful telemedicine appointment on the Society's website. These are especially difficult times for so many people, and I want to make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. You can reach them by calling 1-800-273-8255. Every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find the Real Talk MS podcast at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. With vital funding from supporters like you, the National MS Society will work to ensure that resources and programs like today's are available and that the MS research community rebounds quickly from COVID-19. So the progress and momentum toward finding a cure continues. As you're able, please make a donation to the Society's COVID-19 response fund by texting the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll consider contributing today. You can connect with the National MS Society on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And please make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS research and updates on upcoming programs like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Barbara Geyser for joining us today, and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available for your review on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important, so you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to that survey pinned to the comments section. On YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future webinars. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute and please fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Barbara Geyser and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.